Hello and welcome to this conference on uh, debt and risk sharing in the European Union in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the second conference of this uh, project, the project of the Francisco Manuel dos Santos Foundation, uh, where we are addressing the, the, the topic of public debt in a time so challenging as this is. Um, and we want not only to analyze the present, but also to foresee uh, the future and the legacy that we are living in the time that European countries are facing deep recessions and moving hopefully to fast recoveries, uh, but also when public debt is being piled up in so many countries and when the European Union is taking unprecedented measures to tackle with this uh, crisis. We will we'll discuss this with our two guests, Marcus Brunemeyer and Lucrezia Reichling. Uh, Marcus Brunemeyer is a German economist, is a professor of economics at Princeton University, is director of the Bentheim Center for Finance, and is also a member of several advisory groups, including the IMF, the Federal Reserve of New York, and Bundesbank. Lucrezia Reichling, she's an Italian economist. She's a professor of economics at London Business School. She's non-executive director of AGS Insurance. And she's a founder and shares the non-casting economics platform. And she's also a regular contributor to Project Syndicate. So hi, Lucrezia. Hi, Marcus. And thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah. We will start with uh, your presentations and afterwards we will move to uh, debate. So let's start with you, Marcus, please. Thanks a lot, Pietro, and thanks to the Fonastio for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, be virtually in Portugal and in Lisbon. Um, I would like to talk a few words about debt and risk sharing within the European Union. and. Uh, I would like to outline theoretically first what is debt, what is the role of debt. So debt essentially allows people to borrow to remove resources across time. So and also the person who wants to remove resources in the future or move it from the future to the present. That's what borrowing is. But there's a second important role of debt and that's risk sharing. And the risk sharing comes that if you have a negative shock, a huge negative shock, you don't have to pay back the principal or the interest payment. And that's the risk sharing component. And that arises only if you can default on debt. And that's especially for defaultable bonds. So if you talk about risk sharing, then with the bondholders, it is about default. Of course, we're talking here also about risk sharing across uh, sovereign states in the European Union. But that's a different types of risk sharing going on now. The problem with default, and I would outline the problems with default uh, uh, to some extent, is that once you have default, there are huge bankruptcy costs involved, and there are also huge repercussions for that. And on top of it, there's a multiplicity problem, meaning that if people believe that you will default, you're more likely to default. So that's, there's a good equilibrium, as we say in economics, and there's a bad equilibrium. So there's a equilibrium where everything is fine. Everybody believes that the country will actually, or the company will pay back its debt. The interest rate will be low, and because the interest rate is so low, it's easy to pay back the debt. But there's also a bad outcome, a bad equilibrium, where the interest rate is high. And because the interest rate is high, the country or the company is easy to default. And because investors fear that there will be a default, the interest rate will be high because they want a risk premium. So there's a credit spread going on. And that's essentially the big challenge uh, you face. You might always drift into this default uh, possibility, and that leads to the second equilibrium. So essentially, there are two risks. One risk is that underlying tax revenue for a country or cash flows for a company are risky. But the second problem is that the risk premium also because of indulgence risk, because you might jump to this bad equilibrium. Suddenly investors think, oh, they're afraid of this. The interest rate goes up. And because the interest rate goes up, uh, the default probability goes up. And that is justifies why the interest rate went up. So and that's also, as I mentioned, on top of it, you have contagion risks. You have debt holdout problems, 
you know, some investors, when there's a restructuring, they will not participate in the restructuring, and that makes the whole analysis more difficult. And the two approaches to it, and uh, that relates to a book I wrote on the Euro crisis and the battle of ideas, where, you know, there's a French approach and there's a German approach to it, and there's a Rhine, the river Rhine in between, and that's why it's called the Rhine divide in economic philosophies, where, you know, you can have more an approach where say, you would like to put some firewalls up, up front, so the emphasis was on the fire code and firewalls putting up front, while the French approach is much more on a firefighting approach. Once you're in a crisis, you manage the crisis, you're very active to manage the crisis and intervene. And there's different attitudes to watch a restructuring. The French approach is very opposed to any restructuring because they see all the repercussions any restructuring of that, any default of sovereign debt will bring with it. So let me just say, there's of course also a problem of not defaulting, that's here, you know, the old slide, but then if you look at the right hand, then the problem of not default is you can actually commit to say, I will never default as a country, we will never restructure debt. And that, of course, leads to other problems. This leads to debt, also called debt overhang problems, where, you know, there's so much debt outstanding that the company cannot invest in new things or the country has to go in austerity measures and they are very counterproductive, they slow the growth rate down. So that leads to other problems. So if you don't restructure, so if a country is highly indebted, it might be suboptimal not to restructure as well. And you rely either on very strict austerity measures or on foreign health. And that's where the risk sharing comes in. So in order to understand um, that, it's important to keep the two dimensions in mind. One is transferring resources over time, and the other thing is risk sharing, which comes to default. And here I would like to make an argument that actually sovereign debt, so government debt, is actually different from private debt. Okay? And the reason is that typically a government debt serves as a safe asset. So it's a safe asset where you can actually rush into if there are some problems, and you can park your money for bad times or when you personally have some bad time because you have some healthcare expenditure or you know your car broke down, you have to buy a new car and you can save in some safe asset. And that's what government bonds typically are. And if government bonds were to default, you destroy the safe asset feature. So typically if you go into asset pricing, the traditional asset pricing is all about asset prices of an asset. The value of an asset is just a discounted present value of cash flow. But there are also other elements to it which are service flows. So if you have an asset, it might provide you some extra services. And for example, if you can use an asset as a collateral, it is actually a service that you can use it as a collateral. That pushes up the value of this asset. And the safe asset uh, a feature of an asset, so some subgroup of assets, they are safe assets, and they are actually what I call a good friend. So a safe asset is around when you need it. Okay, it's valuable and liquid when you need it. It's like a good friend. A good friend is around when you're in bad times and he helps you. And the same thing is true with safe asset. And that's a service flow a safe asset provides. And it allows you, when you face some, you know, your car breaks down, to sell the safe asset to somebody else at a fairly high value. It doesn't go down in value dramatically. And it's liquid at a low bit of spread, so you can easily sell it without any big uh, commissions and so forth. And that's essentially what the safe asset is, and that's an extra value. And you need such a safe asset in the economy. And the question is, will the government want to preserve the safe asset feature? And then, of course, uh, in order to have the safe asset value, you want that the risk free rate plus the risk premium, so that's what you get on the safe asset, is smaller than the growth rate of the economy. So if the risk, the interest rate, what the government has to pay, which is the risk free rate plus the risk premium, is smaller than the growth rate of the economy, then the debt grows at the risk rate plus risk premium, and the GDP grows, or grows at the growth rate of G, then over time, even though the government issues some debt, it is the, the, the ratio of debt of GDP is actually declining. And that's a nice feature to have, and the safe asset we can have this feature, but that's a very desirable feature to have. Now, I should say, there's a subgroup of safe assets, which we call money, and money is even better than a safe asset. It's not only preserving its value, there's never a default on it. Besides inflation, I will talk about this later on. Money has an additional feature that you can also use it as a medium of exchange. So you can, you know, somebody wants other goods or bought, and we get away from the friction from all the economy. 
These are safe assets which are very special and hence the payment at a lower interest rate. The price of money is higher, which means it pays even a lower return or the expected return is even lower. So what's the problem with the safe asset and with money is they're a little bit like a bubble that can burst. So the feature, the safe asset state of might go away and the multiple equilibrium story. And that's what we had in the Euro crisis. You know, some of these national sovereign bonds, they lost the safe asset status and there was flight to safety into the German Bund because that was ultimately considered as the key safe asset in Europe. And that leads to destabilizing forces. And you can have an equilibrium, as I said, where the national Portuguese sovereign bond has a government bond has the safe asset status, we can have an equilibrium where it doesn't have the safe asset status. And that's why it makes the whole situation very, very risky. So what can we do? Can we create a safe asset which is not a national one, but a European wide one? And you might say, oh now the commission they can issue you know seven hundred fifty billion uh, uh, worth of uh, euros uh, worth of new debt that will create a safe asset, European-wide safe asset. Or the European Investment Bank is issuing some uh, bonds. That's also a European-wide safe asset. Or even reserves issued by the ECB. That's also a European-wide safe asset. That's essential money. But this is all, you know, in the big scheme of things. You have so many national bonds, so much national debt outstanding. And that could also serve as a safe asset and hence pay a much lower interest rate which makes it then more sustainable. You get away from this bad equilibrium, the good equilibrium. And the other aspect is that, you know, if you have a banking union, we can ask the banks to hold a safe asset as a buffer rather than a, a risky sovereign bond. So if you don't have to hold. And the second thing is we would like to have capital market payment in Europe with a flight to safety out of Portuguese debt into the German bond is mitigated, is much more reduced in times of crisis, but suddenly the Portuguese interest rate is shooting up and the German interest rate is going down, and that makes the whole analysis make the destabilize of the whole European system. Now, what I proposed in 2011 with many other friends, and among them was Ricardo Ries, uh, a uh, my friend uh, who is a Portuguese uh, economist, we proposed something like SPs, European safe bonds, which the Commission and the European Parliament voted in favor of, uh, labeled it the bond uh, backed securities, where essentially you pool national bonds up to a certain limit, and the national bonds, you have a pool of these national bonds, then you issue a single bond and a junior bond. And it's like a waterfall principle. As the bonds in the pool pay off, first the senior bonds are served, and whatever is left, is paid to the junior bond. And you can see that because the senior bond uh, enjoys seniority is protected by the junior bond, it's very, very safe. So even if one country defaults or two countries or half of the countries default, the senior bond is still protected by the junior bond. Of course, the junior bond is highly risky and suffers all the losses, and the junior bond protects the senior bond. And the senior bond would be then the safe asset in Europe. And it would be a big safe asset class on top of it because it would include a lot of these national bonds which we have and they might lose the safe asset status, but the senior bond will not lose it. And that's a big advantage of this. In contrast, there's another proposal out there, so-called e-bonds, so these are the two main proposals, where some European agent buys up national bonds and it should uh, then bonds on its own. Okay? And that essentially is similar and the assumption is that this agency, the European agency, which buys up the bonds enjoy seniority like the IMF does when the IMF moves into a crisis country and so forth. And the remaining outstanding bonds don't enjoy the seniority. They're not pari passu, they're actually then junior. And if you think about it, this is like tranching without pooling. That's essentially, you tranche in each country in a senior bond and a junior bond, and it's without pooling. And I would argue that pooling you know, is a big advantage and the e-bond structure doesn't have this pooling feature, but there's other disadvantages as well. So let me then outline a little bit what's the motivation for this. The motivation for such a bond structure of you know, not mutualizing that, so it's not a mutualization, it's just enjoying together the safe asset status. So that's the idea. You have a safe asset status and you might lose it as a country, as a let's say Portugal, but Germany is not losing it. Let's sign it in a way that we all share it all the time. So 
So we don't use it. And Portugal has a part of the safe asset status all the time as well, because Portuguese citizens also want to save assets, uh, even if the Portuguese sovereign government bonds might lose it. And so one argument is that, okay, we have this boom loop or this diabolic loop of banking risk and sovereign risk. And a lot of uh, ink is held on this. I will not elaborate much about this. But the problem is that the banks hold government bonds. The government bonds lose value. That puts the banks in a difficulty. The banks are in trouble and they're more likely to be bailed out. And that brings government in difficulties and they just hit each other on top of the economy tank, which brings the tax revenue down, which brings the bank the bankers and so forth. So we have this doom loop big time going on. That's one thing. If banks were to hold a senior bond, we don't have this doom loop uh, scenario anymore. But the, the, really the main channel I would like to emphasize today is this flight to safety across borders. Right now, the safe asset is not symmetrically supplied, it's asymmetrically supplied, particularly by Germany, Netherlands, Austria, and other countries. And they are enjoying times of tight a low interest rate, while the southern countries or peripheral countries, their interest rate is exploding. Okay, so that's that's a big problem. You have the price of German debt is going up, i.e. the interest rate is going down. The price of Italian, Spanish, Greek, and Portuguese debt is going down, i.e. the interest rate is shooting up. And the question is, can we rechannel this flight to safety from a cross-border flight to safety to some other flows which are not going across borders anymore? Okay, and that's the analogy is then we want to rechannel. Let me provide an analogy with uh, you know some night defending a city. So there's a city defending it. It, it has uh, walls around it. And it's attacked from outside because there's some guys. There's some attack going on. And and then what you can see what's going on. There's flight to safety. There's some knights that are fleeing the city on the boats on the ships. You know there's a sea next to it. So the Atlantic Ocean. And and then they flee and they weaken the city. The city has to flee into some other safe asset. Some soldier of being. Now, what's the answer on this? You can create, make a seven, second line of defense inside of the city and call it a safe haven. And then the idea is essentially if you have two lines of defense, you have a stronger inner circle. And then when the soldiers want to flee, they might not flee out of the city, they might just flee in the safe haven. And that three channels the flight of safety from out of the city into some inner city, which is much, much stronger. Now, what's the analogy there? The analogy is that the safe haven is like the senior bond, and the city, what's on the outside of the inner city, is the junior bond. And you have traditionally in the Middle Ages, of course, you see uh, castles, they have always at least two defense lines where they can withdraw. And that also gives some equipment to stay within the city, not sneak out and uh, weaken the whole city as a whole. And having some several defense lines makes the whole scenario more uh, better. Now, there was, in the beginning, there was an argument of we should also talk about inflation in the next bond. And so that's, and I would like to make here an argument why this senior bond is the ask is, should be actually also inflation index, ideally. So the inflation at the moment is not very high, but we don't know how it will be down the road. So there is some risk that inflation will go up or down, or the uncertainty is actually more dramatic at this point. As I mentioned already, in order to have a really good safe asset, a very attractive safe asset, if it's the risk rate plus the risk premium on your government bond is smaller than the growth rate of the economy. That's what you really like, that's what you really desire. Because even if you issue some debt now, it's not a big problem because the economy, you can outgrow the debt. So you will really want the growth rate to be high enough. Now, where is this risk premium? And you can actually, when you tranche, you can focus the risk premium either on the senior bond or the junior bond. If you make the junior bond very risky and the senior bond not very risky, then the risk premium is really concentrated in the junior bond. And the senior bond has almost no risk premium. That means this inequality can be much more easily satisfied because the risk premium is very, very small. Or it might be even negative. So it's much more easy to satisfy this inequality, and that's a very desirable feature to have. Now, how can I make the risk premium even smaller if I also take the inflation risk out of it? If I make the senior bond a real bond or an inflation index bond, I take the risk premium for inflation risk also out of it. That's an argument to make the senior bond essentially uh, inflation indexed. That's a, a, you know, 
among all the other advantages we have inflation index bonds, that's really with the tranching, even though the national bonds are not inflation indexed, after you tranche, you take the inflation risk and concentrate it in the junior bond rather than in the senior bond. Now, if you have this pooling arrangement, the nice thing about pooling is that you diversify the remaining risk, which is different. That, you know, you don't know exactly which country will be in difficulties and which ones will be not, but you can pool this risk. And it also gives you, if the whole thing is done at the European level rather than the national level, it gives you a commitment device that nobody is actually gaming this uh, system. Because if each country were to do it on its own, there's a danger that the each country could also issue a senior bond or a junior bond, but then two weeks later or two years later, the country says, no, now I issue a super, super senior bond. And actually the existing senior bond is now junior to the super senior bond. And that's essentially the scheming you can switch off if it's done at the European level, and it also helps to do it in the pooled uh, fashion. Now, So with this, I would like to uh, almost done in a sense of the two ways to default on what I mentioned. Default is very costly, but that's referred to outright default. You restructure your government debt. Because you have all this bankruptcy cost, restructuring is knock on effects, it's still over effect. And this might happen, you, you don't know if it's a liquidity problem a government faces or a country faces, or is it a solvency problem? You really have to restructure the state and country, or it's purely a liquidity problem. And when you make the distinction, when you're in difficulty, you don't know where you stand, essentially. And the advantage of having an inflation default, which means you can print more money, and if the whole thing turns out to be a temporary thing, just a liquidity problem, this whole problem will go away. You can suck out money again, and then you know inflation will never pick up. While when you do an outright default, it's like crossing the Rubicon. Okay, that's like a, that's like a teaser crossing the Rubicon. And now across the Rubicon, there's no way back. Once you do an outright default, it's done. You cannot undo. And it's with a sharp cutoff date, uh, where you know certain bonds are hit. The new bonds, which are not issued, they're not hit. So it's uh, very, very different. And while inflation is hitting all nominal claim holders. But what's the, the other big difference is an outright default will hit primarily the bank who hold a lot of bonds and the, the rich people, while inflation will hit all the workers because it also shows up in their wages. And uh, the, the final difference is that if one country is default, it hits this particular country. There are spillover effects to other countries, of course. Uh, if inflation default is European wide, it hits all of Europe. Now, let me conclude. What just quickly summarize what I said, debt has two roles. One is transferring resources over time, so borrowing and lending. The other thing is risk sharing, but the risk sharing component comes only through uh, default, but default has some bankruptcy costs. And once you have bankruptcy costs, there's this danger that you jump, that you have this extra risk of you know, going to a bad outcome purely because people get concerned. And because they're concerned, interest rates jump up, and then you get in a bad outcome. And the other element is that it destroys the safe asset status. We can easily destroy the safe asset status because once you default, you don't have the safe asset status. And that holds in particular for government debt. It doesn't hold for private companies' debt. So that's the difference. The multiplicity is also there in private debt. But the safe asset status is not the private debt typically. Now, if you want to have this uh, safe asset status and distributed across of Europe, so it's equally distributed across, then you need something like SPs or SPPVS. Pooling and branching is one way to do it without mutualization of that. And if you issue the senior bond called inflation indexed, then you really reduce the risk premium on it. And that makes it easier for this inequality to hold the risk rate plus the risk premium. If I minimize by tranching the risk premium, uh, that is smaller than G. And that's a very attractive feature to have. And uh, the E bond structure would be more like national branching. So each country branches on its own rather than at the European level, pooling first and then branching. And I, I share, um, I'll leave it at that. And I'm happy to discuss. Uh, more details or go in other direction of the previous uh, presentation. Thanks again for having me. It was a pleasure uh, to be able to present the slides and, and look forward to my discussion with Lucrez.
Thank you, Marcus, for your very enlightening um, presentation. We, we will discuss it afterwards. First, I would uh, like to invite Lucrezia uh, to uh, make her uh, presentation. If you please, Lucrezia. Hello, everybody, and uh, yes, thank you for, for the invitation here. It was very sad not to be in Lisbon at this part of the year, you know, which is uh, the best time to be in Lisbon. Anyway, so by part time. So uh, we have been asked to discuss about uh, the consequences of COVID uh, on, uh, on debt. And uh, you know, let's uh, ask the general questions whether we could worry about this situation. So what happened as a consequence of COVID uh, is an increase in the stock of the debt. And uh, here, sorry, I have. I have some data here. You can see the gross uh, public debt as a percentage of GDP for different European countries. And, uh, uh, you know, we can see these two periods, 2008, where the public debt uh, jumped up as the consequence of the financial crisis. Then it really, except for Germany, it doesn't really go down and at a higher level. And then, uh, 2020, a new big shock and a new sharp increase. Now, you can see in the dark line, the, uh, the forecast of the IMF for what's going to happen in the, last, in the, in the next uh, year. But of course, uh, that kind of uh, uh, decline that you can see for both countries uh, will really depend on what will happen to the denominator. And so it is highly uncertain whether uh, the economy will uh, uh, rebound. And we know that uh, uh, there are lots of reasons to believe that actually uh, growth in the next uh, uh, probably couple of years, will be, if not longer, will be uh, actually weak. So the first thing is, uh, um, is the, the threat of public debt. Okay, of the sharp decline on output uh, due to the lockdown. And the second effect uh, is a big increase in the balance sheet of uh, the central bank. So here you see the ECB aspect. Um, and again, uh, you can see the big jump uh, uh, that we had uh, in 2008 uh, after the, uh, the fate of Lehman Brothers. Then uh, we had uh, that in Europe uh, happened late 2015, and then we had this very sharp uh, increase, uh, which is the consequence uh, of the policy that the ECB put in place uh, in order to, um, you know, to, to kind of mitigate the effect uh, of the COVID. So, increasing the stock of public debt, increasing central bank's balance sheet, uh, both uh, phenomena imply a large role the public sector, oh, and both point, uh, both phenomenon point to um, a kind of uh, a fine line, a line which is difficult to define, uh, you know, the line of division between uh, what fiscal policy should do and what monetary policy should do. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, we can think that this is possibly going to be a challenge uh, going on if the situation will, will remain, uh, uh, you know, these branches will remain so, so large uh, for the years to come. We started the uh, the banks uh, uh, remain independent uh, when uh, they have such a large role as intermediary uh, in the financial markets. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, what does this mean for the euro area? So, in a way, uh, as a consequence of this big second, sh of second shocks that we got with in, in, uh, in the last 12 years, uh, um, this debate uh, is going to continue and uh, it's going to produce maybe some new pieces of financial architecture, maybe more division among countries. Okay, so this is, I think, is the relevant discussion to have today. Of what are the implications uh, for our monetary union uh, of uh, this step up uh, of, uh, uh, of you know policies of both from the uh, fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities? Um, 
So uh, let me just say, I mean, I have another chart here just to give you another. Uh, so this is actually the total assets of the four major central banks in monthly change. So you can see this fast increase uh, uh, in the very recent period, uh, which comes to the fact that, of course, uh, uh, you know, this increase uh, in assets is not just an ECB uh, policy, but it is something which. Uh, uh, you know, it's shared by all the major central banks. And in terms of the delta, so the rate of change, you know, what is happening today is even larger than what happened 12 years ago. Okay, so with this premise, uh, I want to ask, uh, um, should we worry about that? Uh, and uh, uh, given the public debt, the high stock of public debt, uh, how do you think the adjustment will take place uh, in the future? So let me start about the question, should we worry about it? So before COVID, the answer by a lot of economists, and here I should cite especially Olivier Blanchard and his authors, was that really we should not worry about the high stock of public debt. And this is because, you know, what really matters for that sustainability is the relation between uh, the real interest rate uh, and the growth rate of the economy. So the, the rate at which uh, you refine your government finances that uh, adjusted for inflation must be respect the rate at which the economy uh, grows. And as long as the rate of growth is higher than the rate of uh, uh, the real rate, uh, then the debt in a way will repay itself. And uh, as uh, Blanca and Otto have uh, um, pointed out, uh, in the last, uh, you know, maybe 15 years, we had a very benign uh, relationship uh, between uh, interest rate, little r, and rate of growth, uh, little g. Okay, so you can see that uh, most of the time, uh, we had that uh, the rate of growth of the economy was higher than, uh, than the real interest rate. And this is uh, uh, these are, uh, uh, data for uh, uh, the euro area as an aggregate, okay? So this is, of course, is not good for every country, and, uh, you know, as Portugal knows, or Italy knows, but on average, uh, the relationship between the little r and g has been quite benign. So is this something that we should expect uh, also now, post-COVID? Well, it is not that clear, actually. Uh, we know that the rate of growth of the economy will probably uh, be lower in the year to come than uh, what uh, we had in the last, uh, say, five years. And this is because uh, probably COVID will imply also a negative productivity shock on how the economy uh, organizes itself. So we don't know whether we are going to have a second wave of the pandemic the stars of the economy after the lockdown uh, have been quite severe in some sectors and uh, you know there is also um, you know a slowdown of uh, uh, international trade which will hit uh, some of the open european uh, european economies so uh, you know this we have to worry about little g but uh, we also may think that, uh, uh, that what the economists call the equilibrium interest rate, the interest rate at which investment and savings equalize, will also be lower uh, in, the next, uh, in the next future. In fact, here there is also historically evidence that, that, so, that uh, actually uh, the equilibrium rate, although it's a, it's a very abstract concept, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something which is very uh, hard to measure, so after pandemics uh, and after this, this that, that shocks, uh, you know, is likely you know to uh, to decline. So with a slow little G and with a slow and with a low uh, um, interest rate, equilibrium interest rate, but the key for policymakers and the key for answering the question: uh, Should we worry about it? Is uh, you know whether uh, between the, the mix between monetary and fiscal policy will be able to keep uh, interest rate low with respect to G. And this is would require the right combination uh, of, uh, you know, keeping nominal interest rate low, so this is mostly uh, monetary policy, and, and, uh, and inflation at the right level. So the right combination between nominal and inflation. 
And this is there are very different ways of, of achieving, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, um, you know, the right combination of phenomenal interest rate and inflation. So we have uh, then asked the question: So what is the likely adjustment? What is likely to happen in Europe given the institutions that we have? Well, one possibility, so let's look at the, at the different, uh, so get now to the second question, how will the adjustment uh, uh, will take place? Well, one possibility is uh, that uh, we will have, uh, you know, prolonged QE, uh, and maybe, you know, very persistent QE, or what, uh, you know, with uh, an emphasized language which, which can, we can call monetization. Um, in a way, just to simplify, we can think that all these public debt they will end up in the central bank balance sheet. I call this a Japanese scenario, okay? A scenario in which the, the, uh, the Bank of Japan absorbs uh, the, the, the public debt uh, of, uh, of its own country. And, uh, you know, some people, uh, um, so in, in, the, in the Euro area, um, well, we should ask whether in general this it would be something that we should worry about, I mean, with kind of monetization. And whether the second question, whether we could actually, it, it would be possible from a, from a political institutional point of view uh, to have a Japanese type of scenario. So, uh, in terms of the macro question, should we worry about the bad monetization? Uh, I mean, it really, uh, it depends, okay? So, so there is never straightforward answer to any of these questions. Well, if interest rate is zero, central bank money and government debt uh, are basically the same thing. So, you know, there really should not, uh, uh, there should be any, no, no reason to worry. But, uh, you know, in the moment in which uh, the kind of macro situation changes uh, and the equilibrium interest rate starts going up, uh, uh, if the central bank uh, keeps the, the real interest rate below this equilibrium interest rate, then this is the moment in which we can see inflation. And of course, I mean, there is a, a nothing wrong about seeing a little bit of inflation, but uh, you know, what we should worry about is that inflation will come and then it will be hard to control. But just be careful, okay? So there is no mechanical relation between uh, increasing in reserve uh, so, and the uh, central bank money and um, and the uh, and, uh, and inflation, okay? And today, actually, central banks uh, pay the interest rate on reserve, so they have an extra instrument which actually delinks uh, the relationship between uh, the monetary base and inflation. So an increase in central bank money does not necessarily lead to an increase in inflation. Whether inflation, whether we will see inflation or not, it will really depend on the interest rate policy that uh, you know, the central bank will be will uh, will, uh, will be able to uh, implement uh, given the level of uh, the equilibrium interest rate. Uh, so, whether we will have inflation or not, uh, it really depends on whether monetary policy will be able to do its jobs. So far, um, uh, we don't know, uh, we don't see uh, inflation uh, uh, being priced in the market. Here there are some uh, pictures for you. Uh, this is uh, headline inflation and core inflation. You can see that the core inflation uh, is, uh, is flat. And headline inflation is actually declining, uh, obviously, because of uh, what's happening to, uh, to oil prices and energy prices in general. But uh, if you look at the expectations, uh, you can also have the same picture that, uh, you know, the Soviet professional forecasters or market forecasters do not price uh, inflation in the future. And of course, they may, uh, they may be wrong, but uh, so far, uh, we don't see an expectation for inflation developing. And even if uh, we have seen a big increase uh, in the, the central bank balance sheet. Okay, so this is one uh, one one issue. Okay, what can central bank do to uh, to implement the right level of real interest rates and avoid the um, uh, you know a scenario in which inflation will get out of uh, you know out of control. Uh, in the euro area, there is another issue. And the issue is that uh, uh, when we're talking about little r and little g, 
Little r is really what Marcus called the interest rate of the state asset. But uh, not all that is the same in the euro area because countries do not issue their own debt. Uh, they, do, sorry, they don't issue their own currency. Uh, so the debt of, um, of uh, uh, countries, uh, the, the members of the monetary union, is a little bit like the debt of emerging markets yeah, which borrow in currencies which uh, are like the dollars and they're not countries they issue their own. And this is actually, uh, Marcus already, uh, you know, explained this, this problem uh, very well. Uh, it is what was the experience of the debt crisis uh, of 2011 and 2012, uh, when we have seen that because of these reasons, uh, uh, the debt of uh, members of the, European, uh, of the monetary union uh, um, is not necessarily safe and, and uh, you know, countries uh, are very prone and very vulnerable to what Marcus calls self-fulfilling liquidity, liquidity crisis. So uh, if we want to keep uh, this uh, uh, um, risk premium for countries which are perceived to be more vulnerable, and here I'm talking about my own country like Italy, but also your country, Portugal, then this may imply that if this situation of credibility persists, the ECB has to use fully the flexibility that now is already using in the, in, in this, in the new, uh, in the new uh, uh, package of, of in the new kind of wave of, of asset purchases that, that they are putting in place. In the sense that the, the purchases will have to be, uh, you know, skewed um, in favor of certain countries, meaning that instead of uh, buying assets in relation to the contribution of the capital key, they will have uh, to buy um, to buy uh, government bonds uh, in relation to, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the spreads on government bonds. This is obviously very, very controversial because this could be uh, considered to be a form of monetization and, uh, you know, lack of uh, proportionality. Let's uh, just rem remember that uh, the, the German Court of Justice just challenged the ECB exactly on this issue of proportionality, uh, not in relation to the, to the new measures, but uh, in relation to uh, the QE that was implemented in 2015. But this, you know, may actually come up again as a challenge uh, um, if the situation, uh, you know, would, would you know, kind of persist in this way. So I would say that uh, the pure Japanese model, in which all the Italian bad debt, uh, to make an exaggeration, end up uh, in, the, in the balance sheet of the ECB, is not really feasible uh, in a monetary union. And so then we really have to worry about uh, what would be the alternatives uh, in a situation uh, which I'm, I'm talking here about the gas scenarios uh, in which uh, actually uh, the rate of growth would persist below. And here um, we can see, think of different uh, possibilities. One possibility is financial repression. And I want to explain a little bit about what financial repression uh, it is like, what, what it is about. Uh, another possibility uh, is actually you know, that some of these countries will repeat uh, the experience of the, uh, of the debt crisis and will get into a program. Another possibility, of course, will be restructuring. So, and I would argue that actually financial repression is perhaps the least costly alternative amongst these different alternatives from a political, econo from a political economy point of view. Although, you know, this has uh, enormous costs. So what is financial repression in the new millennium? So that would mean forcing banks to hold more government bonds uh, of their own. So the, the banks uh, of Portugal would have to, uh, to hold more government uh, Portuguese government bonds. So to do exactly what the, the opposite of what, what Marcos is advocating, instead of diversifying, you just, uh, you know, for, you're nationalized, okay? So you, uh, we go for the extreme form of what Marcus called the, um, the sovereign bank. So, um, so 
So in, in a way, you know, forcing banks to hold more, more government debt that may be actually the optimal thing to do if the government cannot commit to repay its debt. And, uh, you know, this will increase the economic cost of the default. Now, uh, I'm not uh, having a, this is not an abstract discussion because in Italy today, you know, there is a proposal by the head of, uh, of the security regulator which is uh, exactly that, okay? So the, the proposal is that Italy would issue perpetual bonds with an interest of 2%, which is correspond to the inflation target uh, of the ECB. And this is exactly, I mean, this is a kind of a form of, uh, of financial repression. And we know from history that in some cases uh, can be affected. For example, this is what Italy did uh, in the interwar period, uh, in the 20s and in the 30s. So uh, it each, uh, uh, you know, what Italy did at the time was to lend the debt maturity and uh, then implement a mandatory debt conversion or short-term debt into long-term debt. And this uh, conversion was a sort of partial default because, I mean, it implies a, a big loss for the owners of converted bills. So you can think of this as an alternative to restructuring in, in which the losers uh, are, um, you know, are your own citizens in a way. But it's an effective way of keeping interest rate low, create demand for public debt, uh, and then uh, having access uh, to the private savings uh, of, uh, of the savers of your own country. Of course, this is possible only, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the, in, in the interwar period, it was, it was uh, easier because there was uh, state control of interest rates, uh, there was no financial uh, integration, it was easier to force banks uh, to hold government debt at low interest rates, uh, it might be more difficult today, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that some of the members of the monetary union, uh, if challenged, uh, they will uh, go into this direction. And this, of course, uh, has uh, um, has some cost because create distortion and actually may have uh, a negative effect uh, on the rate of growth uh, in the long run. A second option uh, would be actually to uh, reverse the expansionary fiscal policy that uh, we have seen with COVID um, and increase the primary surplus. But this actually could be self-defeating uh, if by, uh, you know, uh, by consolidation now, or early consolidation, then that will, we will have a negative effect on growth. Uh, and that the self-defeating in the phase in which appetite was such that the debt to GDP ratio will increase rather than decrease. Then in that case, uh, you know, we can see that that can be adjusted either by a series of defaults or uh, by the treasury uh, or the treasuries uh, or the, you know, the, the, in our case, uh, you know, keep pressure on the central bank to keep the real interest rate below the equilibrium rate uh, in order to implement it. Okay? So this is something that the economy is called fiscal dominance, in which the fiscal authorities are in the private seat rather than the monetary authority. Now, the third scenario, and this is where I come from, I come to a conclusion very soon, uh, is where actually where central banks and finance ministers cooperate and this is actually very difficult to implement uh, in the euro area because uh, we are an imperfect asymmetric federation with the federal monetary authority and national fiscal authority. But there have been a lot of you know, several proposals uh, uh, of uh, you know, building up uh, instruments uh, to uh, favor and to facilitate this cooperation between the monetary fiscal policy in the monetary union. For example, uh, um, we could think of uh, having, uh, um, you know, an emergency, an emergency, a common emergency budget uh, that could be used uh, uh, when large common shops uh, you know, hit the union and the pandemic would be, you know, the obvious case. And then we could think of expansionary policy through this emergency budget. Uh, and this financial uh, policy would, uh, um, would uh, cause an increase in inflation and therefore an increase in the real rate. 
But, uh, uh, you know, in coordination with the central banks, uh, you, we could think of, uh, you know, tolerate a temporary crisis in inflation uh, with, you know, with, uh, with some target. Uh, so, in a way, this could be a sort of managed, coordinated uh, or managed monetization. And the key here, uh, the key feature here would be to have a, a very clear framework in which the cooperation between fiscal and monetary policy will help to stimulate the economy, but within a framework in which there will be a commitment of the price of the in the medium run, but a tolerance of the deviation from the inflation target in the short, in the short run. And this would, uh, of course, uh, will have to go with the management of expectations, uh, um, which would be, uh, you know, uh, maybe easier if the social framework uh, were, you know, well designed. So I think that uh, this kind of tools uh, uh, is really what we need to have uh, in our union if we want uh, to avoid, uh, uh, you know, the more negative scenarios uh, uh, in case uh, uh, in which uh, the economy will remain weak for the years to come. And, uh, you know, let me conclude uh, uh, with a few remarks about uh, whether, you know, given the fact that we do not have these tools, uh, what can we expect for the future? So if I have to think today, I frankly do not expect uh, a default in any of the big euro area countries. I think that some form of financial repression is probably more likely because it's easier from a political economy point of view, but it will be very dangerous uh, from uh, the point of view of the union. And, uh, you know, because that will apply to implementation and, uh, you know, to Along national, you know, between, uh, between the, the fiscal uh, and, and the financial sectors along national lines. Um, uh, the alternative uh, uh, will be that the ECB will take uh, a quasi fiscal role, but I think that also this society will be quite dangerous from the cohesion of the union. And, uh, you know, if we look at what, uh, uh, what, uh, how the, uh, the different European institutions have responded to the, to the crisis and compare it to 2008 and 2011 and 12, I mean, there is room to be optimistic because, you know, they were proactive um, and uh, clearly, I mean, that there is some fiscal stimulus that is put in place. But, but still, what we do not have uh, is this mechanism through which, uh, uh, you know, implement this type of stabilization through a coordination of fiscal and monetary policy in a situation in which uh, interest rate is at the zero lower bound, and so monetary policy struggles uh, to be effective. So I think that, uh, you know, we will probably maybe avoid the worst, but uh, what I really wish, and here is more a wish than, than a prediction, uh, is that uh, this crisis uh, will help us uh, you know, to clarify our ideas on what are the new pieces of architecture that we need to build. And uh, we are not quite there yet, although we have made some progress. And uh, until uh, we complete this process, uh, I think that uh, the monetary union will continue to be at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucrecia, for your presentation and for all the questions that you brought to us. Uh, we will now um, have a debate uh, and I'll make you some questions, but I invite you to feel free to comment each other's uh, remarks. Uh, but starting with you, Marcus, uh, you, you strike me as uh, relatively optimistic on the EU response um, so that it will be strong enough to avoid a sovereign debt crisis. Uh, let, me, let me be blunt. Uh, do you see any risk of having a debt crisis in the future? I mean, that's a tricky question in a sense because I was talking about self-fulfilling expectations and I don't want to uh, trigger some self-fulfilling expectations. Uh, one has learned from previous experience, you can never rule it out with 100%. But, uh, you know, if you policymakers react smartly, uh, then it can be, you know, minimized. The risk can be really minimized. And that also what shows up in the risk premium, 
where you know they went down significantly in the recent weeks. So that's uh, what you can show. The proposal I made essentially is a proposal to bring the ECB out out of the line of fire. At the mo at the moment, you know, when I draw this firefighter or fire engine uh, picture, it's essentially primarily the ECB which was uh, in charge of uh, making sure there's no the fire is contained or is not breaking out. And uh, I think we should get to a structure where it's much less reliant on active intervention by the ECB, which is in a structure which is self-stabilizing, where nobody has to intervene. And if somebody has to intervene, it might be also the government. And we have seen that, you know, through the German-French proposal from Macron and Angela Merkel, uh, then the fiscal side or the government side is a moving, and that's a good sign. So we see some movement in the right direction. And uh, I just want to caution relying purely on, on, on the ECB's action all the time. But you believe that this ECB action um, that has been uh, put forward will prevent a, a fragmentation in the financial markets? Yeah, it did already. I mean, you saw many spreads coming down uh, in various countries. So it actually helped to stay away from the bad equilibrium, from the bad outcome, the self-fulfilling outcome. So it made a difference um, and it helps. Of course, uh, as a German, you're always worried about deflation and inflation. And what I see is that in the short run, the inflation pressures are not very high because people are very insecure. There's a lot of uncertainty. People want to hold more safe assets. So they're safe. So there's demand for a lot of government bonds at the moment. And the inflation pressures might not be so high, but it might change. Uh, it might be, the might be this what I call inflation whipsaw. There might be inflation pressures coming up down the road. And then it, managing the situation will be much more difficult especially for the ECB. And that's why it's important that you have a structure where you keep this uh, potential threats into mind. And the key of the European architecture is the independence of the central bank, that the central bank is independent and very strongly independent can act without interference from the national governments too much. And uh, for monetary policy purposes to stay within its mandate. But you would agree that uh, it is needed some uh, coordination between the fiscal policy and the monetary policies. I agree with that. So that's definitely the case. And, and you see currently some coordination coming online. I think that's um, it's important. I also see the dangers that we, what Lucrezia, perhaps if I can go to that of financial repression, um, it is one way which we experienced after the Second World War, where the debt levels were very high and we went to a financial repression phenomenon. Uh, it's different now because, as Lucrezia pointed out already, at that time, markets were not so open. It was very difficult to transfer your wealth from you know, Portugal to Germany. Now it's much more difficult. So if Portugal were to implement some financial repression, Many people would bring the money out from Portugal to Germany or some other countries or Luxembourg or Netherlands. And, and that makes it much more challenging uh, at the moment. On the other hand, we don't want to really, you know, have no reallocation of capital going on. We don't want to limit that. And that's, we had a lot of benefits, a lot of extra growth coming from being able to reallocate capital. And as we, if you look at this R versus G, or this RF plus the risk premium, which is the G Lucrezia was talking about, has to be smaller than G ideally. If we hinder or make it very impossible for capital to move around where it's most profitable, the G is going down. And that actually makes it much more difficult to satisfy this inequality, which we would love to satisfy in order to make it able, make us able to get out of this crisis more easily. Hmm. Lucrezia. Um... You, uh, <clears throat> you yourself were quite clear on the, um, on the importance of this um, interest rate being lower than the, the, the economical growth uh, rate. Um, you, don't, you seem not to be too frightened with uh, some kind of high debt, low growth trap, but there are uh, challenges on regarding not only the interest rate but also the growth. Which one would would you be more? Uh, would you stress more, uh, interest rate, meaning inflation, or 
uh, growth, economic growth, meaning the shock, the effects of the shock on productivity that we're facing? Um, well, I mean, it's not that I'm not worried. Okay, I am worried. <laughs> But uh, the, uh, the question, I, I don't expect uh, Italy to default, okay? So I, I think that uh, probably we will manage the situation uh, in a way that, uh, uh, so that we will be able to have a combination of uh, policies that, that will manage, uh, you know, to keep uh, uh, the interest rate, uh, uh, you know, lower than, uh, than, uh, than the growth rate by a combination of some, some form of financial repression, perhaps, uh, and uh, some uh, uh, non-proportionality in the intervention of the ACB, and some help on the fiscal side, uh, which is coming now through the various programs that have been put in place uh, by the Commission, uh, etc. And not only, but also some coordination of fiscal policy at the national level. I was very impressed by the fiscal package that has been put, to, put together by the Germans, for example, which is a very aggressive uh, Keynesian package, uh, which will uh, definitely have a strong multiplier uh, on, on neighboring countries. So I think that as usual, we will not do, you know, the optimal policy as, uh, you know, academics will write down, uh, uh, you know, will design, design it, uh, um, you know, outside of, uh, of the context of the political, uh, of the political discussion. But uh, I think that uh, we are much more equipped today to avoid, uh, for example, the self-fulfilling liquidity crisis that we had seen uh, in 2011 and 2012. I think that, uh, uh, you know, the ECB this time was not afraid, for example, of uh, uh, buying uh, Italian bonds in higher proportion uh, than the capital T, uh, and to give the message to, uh, to the market uh, that uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, they have the inner power to use the flexibility. But as Marcus, I think that eventually uh, we cannot leave uh, the ECB to do the job on its own. And uh, the reason is that the ECB is an independent institution, uh, and uh, so there is an equal legitimacy. And so we have to put the uh, ensemble of our economic policies in Europe uh, on the firmer, on the firmer ground of, uh, uh, you know, of, of the process, which has to involve uh, uh, the democratic process and, the, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, that you know can only come with uh, you know to go to the, to the legitimacy of the parliaments of the national parliament. Hmm. So, um, in that sense, uh, okay, so we have to be balanced. Um, you don't expect Italy to default, and, and let's bear in mind that other countries are adding to high level public debt, such as Portugal, Greece, uh, even France and, 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 and Spain. And you are quite impressed with the German um, package, uh, the aggressive package. And, the, and this shows other things, uh, another thing, which is uh, that the shock is symmetric, but the response uh, is not. Um, can this, this crisis uh, aggravate the gap between stronger and fiscally weaker uh, countries? I think this crisis has the danger to aggravate uh, the differences and also to, uh, to challenge uh, the single market, okay? not only the monetary union, but the single market because of, uh, because of these differences. However, um, I think that uh, if you look at the, uh, the several measures that, that have been put in place, I mean, these measures to a certain extent address this problem, in particular the recovery fund, the new generation of Europe, as it's called. Oh, I mean, the negotiations are not over, but there is a, a reasonable uh, um, expectation that uh, the negotiations actually end up in the interim example uh, quite soluble. They, uh, the, this new package, so the recovery fund, uh, it, uh, it has a lot of innovation, OK? 
Okay, so the one innovation, for example, that the Commission can now issue is on that, uh, which is, uh, it could do before, but it has never done uh, in this uh, uh, proportion, okay, to the amount that they're doing it. So that's a, a, it's a huge innovation. And the other innovation is that the disbursement uh, will be given uh, uh, not in proportion of the contribution to the budget, but in contribution of the but in proportion of, of the need, uh, the economic need of the country. So there is an element uh, of solidarity and transfer, uh, which is totally new. And, uh, you know, the, uh, I think these two things uh, are uh, already a sign uh, of an incredibly strong political commitment uh, from both the side of Germany and France uh, to keep the house going. And uh, so, I mean, we can discuss about uh, the single element uh, of, of, um, of these measures, uh, and uh, of course, we think it is perfectible. But uh, I see here a big discontinuity with the past. Uh, so that makes me feel that the political commitment to keep the union, uh, uh, you know, in safe, uh, it, it's huge. And after all, uh, uh, you know, that's what matters. Even for the fact of what the ECB will do, even a central bank with all, with all its power, without, uh, you know, the support of the political authority will not be able to save the day. And remember that uh, also in 2012, Mario Draghi could say whatever he said, it was because there was an agreement with the Germans uh, about, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, introduce the, the banking union and so on. And so, and I think this political commitment uh, uh, to go you know, to be uh, stronger today than we have done. Hmm. Marcus, uh would you agree that, uh, like uh, using the term that uh, Locretia um, presented, uh, countries may face some financial um, repression? Yes, that's one possible outcome. Uh, I think it's not clear whether it's a desirable outcome. Uh, uh, it's very important if it's done that it doesn't really reduce the growth rate of the country. And uh, the danger is, of course, that the country sees very quickly that, oh, you can bring the interest rate down, you can bring the R down, because that's very obvious, it's very visible. But you don't see that the growth rate of the country will go down too, which, you know, will translate only in lower growth rate in one year, two, three or five years later. And it doesn't really help and it makes this very counterproductive. And that's always dangerous when you have um, policy measures to take that you see immediately benefits, but the, the costs only show up later in a lower growth rate. So that's why I think I'm skeptical that this is the right approach, except for some marginal measures here and there. And the second message I would look, like to convey about financial repression, if people anticipate that, you get already a flight to safety at the moment. So if people anticipate that there will be financial repression coming up, let's say, in a particular country, capital will go out already today uh, because they say, OK, if I buy this particular bonds, let's say, you know, it's from a certain country which plans to implement the financial repression, banks will not buy this bond anymore or investors will not buy it. They will immediately go to another country and uh, and that's brings the interest rate already up today. So that's a little bit uh, a problem. Uh, if you want to do it, you have to do it by huge surprise and you have to do it in a smart way that um, it doesn't hinder growth down the road. Hmm. One of the things that you mentioned in, in your presentation, Marcus, was uh, what you call the straight jacket co commitment that leads to uh, austerity. Um, do you trust that this framework that is being designed will uh, prevent um, austerity measures? I mean, the question basically is who to tax, who is going to pay in the future? Yeah. So essentially, if you don't have a European-wide arrangement uh, and the country wants to preserve a safe asset status, so in order to keep the interest rate low on a trustworthy government bond market and used by the citizens as a safe asset to save in this asset, one approach is to say we will never default and then we get to that overhang problems and austerity measures which also then hurts the growth rate down the road. 
So in this regard, it has similar negative outcomes as financial repression uh, mentioned before. And there it could actually be a European structure like the SPs or SDBs would be useful to have a European safe asset and help out to avoid to jump into bad equilibrium of the, that self-fulfilling phenomenon kick is in. So that's what the European arrangement could do. I would prefer a system where it does not require some government intervention. You set up a system which is self-stabilizing. So whenever some pressures come up, immediately the system will react to it and eliminates the bad outcome. Of course, you can do it with austerity measures and with strong, strong commitment never to default. But uh, the worst outcome is, you know, if you see and look forward into the future and you can see one scenario where it's a cascade of defaults in various countries and that when it's happened, the risk premium will shoot up, the rating agencies will downgrade several of the bonds and then you have essentially a situation as the trade mentioned 2011, 2012, the risk interest rate goes up and it's very hard to intervene. The ECB can intervene, but you know, in the long run, the ECB should not be constantly the only firefighter. You should have a system which is more with firewalls where actually there's less danger to the system as a whole because it's set up as a self-stabilizing system. Hmm. Marcus, both of you stressed the importance of inflation, but also the uncertainty about uh, inflation. How can we uh, deal with uh, with sir, such uncertainty? So the problem is inflation is, is bad or too low inflation is also bad. But what's really all the third element, which is bad, as you mentioned, is the volatility or the uncertainty in inflation. Where we don't know what the inflation will be because if there's a huge amount of uncertainty, you might not want to invest in the long run because of all this uncertainty and people ask a risk premium to to get some funding so the interest rate actually will go up uh, for long-term investments. Yeah. And the short-term interest rate might still be low, but the long-term interest rate is much higher because you get the high inflation risk premium. And that's the that's danger with uh, inflation. And the way, as I mentioned earlier, I see this initially, I don't see much inflation pressure, so we will fight actually low inflation. And then suddenly we have to switch to fight high inflation potentially. And there might be huge disagreement in the market when this switch might occur. And we know from many making market experiences, you know, uh, that markets are typically not very forward looking. They suddenly radically switch uh, in the other direction. We have to watch out for that. And essentially as a central bank, you have to be ready that when this erratic switch might occur into a different regime, that you can also change your policies accordingly. And that's, you don't want to tie down your hands too much, uh, that you're not able to make this radical change of course, if it's ever required. You don't want to be caught in a trap, essentially. That's the danger what the market often would like to trap somebody, and then you're trapped and then things change, and then you can't react because you're trapped because of fiscal dominance or financial dominance. You don't you want to as the central bank, stay in the driver's seat. You want to have monetary dominance, as uh, Lucrezia pointed out. Much over the, so there should be some coordination. I think that's a good thing to have, but the central bank should be in the driver's seat, at least in one of the main driver's seats, uh, to make sure that you know we can very quickly react to anything that's showing up. Lucrezia, hmm. so the uh, fiscal dominance and, uh, and austerity in the future, meaning who to tax, like I said before, is, um, is, uh, is something that must need uh, dwelt with right now, prevented uh, right now, then defined right now. Um, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think that uh, uh, I, mean, I think this is not the moment uh, uh, for fiscal consolidation. Uh, for, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, unlike uh, uh, 10 years ago, I think that everybody understands that today. Uh, however, I, mean, uh, I think it's important uh, uh, to, to, to be mindful of the fact that there is an uncertainty about future inflation, in part because uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about uh, uh, whether this shock uh, uh, can also be understood as a negative effect on productivity. 
And, uh, you know, in, in that case, okay, so it's, it's one way to understand that the effect of the, on the real economy of COVID uh, is like a negative for productivity cost, then uh, we see this kind of some point uh, inflation to come. And as Marco was saying, that inflation will come, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, markets are not very good at, uh, uh, at forecasting inflation, and uh, and then it might be difficult for the ECB to be, uh, you know, to, to manage expectation in the appropriate way. I mean, I there is nothing mechanical about that. I think that, uh, uh, that you know, this is definitely something that uh, we, we have to keep in mind. Uh, and for the, for the next uh, immediate future, as I said in my presentation, I don't expect inflation, but uh, you know this is not something that uh, should be ruled out. Okay. And it, it, for, for that reason, it's important to have a commitment to price stability. But I think that that commitment should be a medium-term commitment. That in such situation, this situation, the coordination between market and fiscal policy should be allowed to engineer temporary inflation oh, because this is actually what we need to keep real interest rate low to avoid the deflation rate. In his presentation, Marcus uh, talked about the, what he called the di diabolic loop about uh, banking and sovereign risk, um, and, and he stressed the, the, the way to prevent it and to, and to, to avoid it. Do you, Lucrecia, uh, sh uh, think that we should worry with the impacts of, uh, of the crisis in European banks, namely banks, uh, Italian banks, Portuguese banks, Greek banks? I think that uh, one of the characteristics of this crisis is that uh, you know the banks of the ones were in a better shape uh, than uh, in 2008. Uh, so they are definitely they are more uh, uh, capitalized than they used to be uh, when the 2008 uh, crisis struck. So they are more solid. Okay. So that, but uh, uh, and uh, you know, I think the regulation that were put in place in the last ten years of the liquidity and capital, uh, you know, have moved the financial system more uh, solid. On the other hand, uh, uh, we know that the solidity of banks uh, also is the mirror of the solidity of the real economy. If the real economy struggles eventually. The banks will end up struggling as well. But uh, I mean, this crisis has not started in the financial sector. It may end up there as well, but this is not where it's starting. So okay, <clears throat> we are almost finishing, but I would like to make one final question to both of you because uh, we've been talking about public debt, but you yourselves come from different countries that look at this public debt issue, typically from um, a different perspective. Uh, so, meaning just looked at Germany is going to probably to pay, you know, is paying lower interest rates and uh, the European Union eventually will, uh, will pay, or that is, see that Italy has one of the highest public debts in the world. Um, can you, Marcus, tell, uh, share with us how our German looks at this unprecedented measures that are, putting, being, uh, are being put up at, at place by the European Union? Yeah, I think what, uh, what's surprising is compared to the previous crisis that the public is actually, German public is very much behind of the European initiative uh, this time around. And one thing is, the first thing, because Germany was very frugal before the crisis, it was in a position to be very generous now and implement very aggressive uh, policy measures, which has positive spillover effects to the rest of Europe. So the more aggressive Germany invests, the better it is for other countries as well because of this positive spillover effects. But the public is also behind of all the European measures, and that was is different from the previous crisis, I would say, for one main reason. It is seen this time the crisis is coming from outside. It's not anybody's fault. It's not that anybody was running up debt uh, before and that, you know, uh, led to the crisis, as was seen in the previous crisis. So the perception in this crisis is very, very different. And there's broad support in the German public for this Macron-Merkel plan to, you know, give some taxing power to the Europeans and uh, start a large um, uh, recovery fund. 
And that makes it very, very different and much more uh, likely that this thing will happen. Of course, as I mentioned before, it's very, there's a huge responsibility for the European institutions here as well, because there's a ton of money they can distribute. And if this is not well distributed across Europe and within the country to the right hand, there will be scandals and this might backfire in the trust in European institutions in general. So it's good that this happens. But it, there's also a huge responsibility and a huge challenge for the European institutions to distribute this money well and wisely, such that it's not wasted. So the public support in Germany might go away if there are scandals coming from various countries saying, oh, this money was abused. But then the support will go away very, very quickly and it will backfire big time. And the whole European idea will suffer from that. Lucrezia. And can, what, what about you? Can you share with us the Italian point of view well, I mean, I just gave a hearing to the Italian Parliament uh, and that, uh, the, yesterday. And, uh, you know, I hear that uh, some people, were, you know, they're still complaining about the Europe not doing enough. But actually, Italy is the big beneficiary of uh, of, of these uh, several different measures. So, so I think that uh, overall, the country has become very anti-European in the last. Uh, few years, uh, is shifting again uh, into a more pro-European position. This is what's coming in the polls. Uh, but I agree with Marcus that, that uh, this is a huge problem because there will be quite a lot of money to distribute and the process would be quite uh, uh, complicated because uh, this money will have to be linked to a national plan uh, implying uh, the design of priorities uh, within uh, you know, the, the, the lines, the guidelines uh, of the European, uh, the European uh, uh, semesters and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, many things can go wrong, okay? So the countries will have to have the institutional capability of producing good projects and implementing good projects uh, in a transparent way. And so this is a, a principle of conditionality. So this money will be, uh, you know, the disbursement of this money will, uh, will be monitored by the European institutions. Huh? So, so we'll have this form of conditionality, which is very different than the conditionality we had in the past when, for countries that, uh, that went to the program. But it's really about monitoring and about uh, interacting uh, between different levels of government, the federal and the local. So there is a lot, there will be a lot to learn. Uh, hopefully it will be a good process, but a lot of things may also go wrong. And if they go wrong, uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of capital that we now have, uh, uh, you know, European uh, social capital may, may get eroded. Lucrezia, Marcus. Thank you very, very much for being with, uh, with me and with us uh, in this debate and for your precious insights. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you for thank uh, you having much. been thank with you. us in this conference too. We will uh, meet each other next week for another conference, the third of the Francisco Manuel Santos Foundation project. We'll be having for, uh, as guests uh, Nazaré Costa Cabral and uh, Francisco Franco. Thank you very much. See you.